recording on Skype and I'm going to hit the record button on Audacity. All right. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Testing on the radio. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Testing on the radio. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Testing on the radio. Good morning, Pete Giuliano. It is Friday, the 17th of June, 2022. And that makes us, what's the number, Pete? Number 238. 238. Right. Crank Two. it in, Robert. Crank it in, Ralph. Crank it in, fellas. Crank it in. Off to a off to a good start here this morning. First of all, some future travel log, Pete. Travel log looking into the future. Because we're all about the future here on Solder Smoke. And I am I have been engaged in what I call cathartic decluttering. Ooh. Cathartic decluttering. It makes you feel better when you start you're, decluttering. You're getting rid of the S thirty eight E's. I'm only getting rid of one of them. Okay. So I feel like I feel like like Solomon from the Bible, you know, he had to, he decided to cut the baby in half. I'm cutting the shack in half. Ooh. And you would think, you would think if I did that. First of all, why am I doing that? Because we are creating Pete what I think is going to re- be referred to as SSSS. Ooh. Solder Smoke Shack South. Ooh. SSSS. Okay, you you heard the acronym here first. So for a while, Elisa and I have been planning on going down to the Dominican Republic, her home country, during the winter months. So we're getting a place down there. It's good because it lets her take care of her, her, her aging mom close by, her home country. We like the place. It's winter. It's nice there in the winter. You speak the language. Speak the language. <laughs> lived there before. It's going to be great. Um, so we, we're getting all that set up. But, I, but one thing I said is I, I have to have a ham shack down there. You know, you can't be without a ham shack. So I started looking around and I realized what I should do is just take half of everything that I have here, everything, parts, tools, test gear, rigs, antennas, everything, half. So I have in the other room, these big plastic boxes. And every time I see something that I should have down there also. So for example, I saw my, my, my resistor collection, right? Carefully selected resistors. I told Mauser, send me another one. They go into the box. I have two S38Es. Nobody needs two S38Es. Not even one. (laughs) Nobody (laughs) needs one. (laughs) So, but anyway, I put one of them in the box. I have a whole bunch of bid Xs. Half of the bid Xs went into the box. How about the Um, HA600? No, that's going to stay here. That's going to stay. That's going to stay here. Um, the DX 100 will also stay here, believe me for good reasons. Um, but anyway, so we're, we're, we're moving everything and it's, you know, the scary thing is though, Pete, I've already probably taken out about a quarter of the stuff that I have here in the shack, but I don't notice any difference. It looks just I, I, bad. I don't either. <laughs> you can see it. it looks terrible. I don't either. <laughs> so I tell my wife, I said, honey, look, I've gotten rid of all this stuff. And she's like, where? Where did it, where did it go? Where was it? But so I think I'm going to have to do some more cathartic decluttering. But that's the, um, that's what's going on. Everything, half of everything must go south. I've also reestablished contact with my buddies from the Dominican Radio Club. And this is really cool. They're helping me get my Dominican license and uh, or actually a, a, a kind of a, a, a reciprocal license arrangement that we could use that I used before. Before I was N2CQR stroke HI8, I am now going to be N2CQR stroke HI7. Mm. But, you know, similar but different. It's going to be it's going to be good. It's going to be good. So we'll, we'll be down there probably next winter. But we're getting going. Hey, peep. Before we go, we have to we have to talk a little bit about our sponsor. Yes, Parts Candy, Carlos out there in Chicago. Look at them. I even have you could see them on the video. Look at that man. Look at nice. those. Look at those test leads. Nice. They're beautiful colors, and you know, we were talking about how important these um, test leads are when troubleshooting and stuff. You know, and I think you and I both have been talking about the disappointment that comes or the the frustration that comes when you're trying to troubleshoot a rig, something you built or something old that you're working on, and you used a, you use a test lead to sort of connect power to a, a particular stage, and you think, oh, well, now, now look, it's not working. So, ha, ah, maybe this stage is not getting something wrong in there. It's not getting power. 
And then you realize that the reason it's not getting power is the test lead that you're using is so cheap that they didn't even they didn't even solder the alligator clip to the wire. They just crimped it. They crimped it through the insulation. Holy cow. That is really hit and miss. It might work a couple times, not work a couple times. I guess the 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 phrase that we want to use for this this in this episode of solder smoke is don't scrimp on the crimp or don't scrimp Ooh, with the crimp. Nice. Don't scrimp nice. with a crimp. I want a trademark on that one. But um, anyway, what we're saying is that you should use the the test leads from Parts Candy. Our, our buddy Carlos out there in Chicago, one of us, an electronics tinkerer. He's got his own business there. And he hand solders the wires to the alligator clips. So when you get a test lead from Carlos and Parts Candy, you know that that connection is going to be good. When you put that lead in there and connect power to a stage through one of Carlos's test leads, you know power is actually getting there. And the problem, if there's a problem, is in the stage you're testing and not in the test lead that you connected there. So this is this is really important. Carlos has got a, a kind of a, a growing variety of test leads available, not only for with alligator leads, but different sizes of alligator leads and also test the kind of test leads that you'd want to connect an oscilloscope up to or something like that. All, all of his, his products are available and you can see them on his, um, on his eBay site. Just search for parts candy, one word on, on eBay. I have the link up. I'm going to put it up here on the, uh, on the blog page. It's basically www.ebay.com slash USR slash parts candy. But if you want to get to them even quicker, just go to the solder smoke blog on the left-hand side. You'll see the leads there. Click on the picture, the colorful test leads. Boom. It takes you right to Carlos's page. Buy some of his test gear. And remember what I said, don't scrimp with a crimp. Get a real test lead from Carlos. Pete, your bench. I know you've been busy. You've got, you've got heavy family responsibilities lately. Yes. But, but you still, I, I can still tell that the N6QW mind is, is at work, exploring the, the corners of radio. So what have yes. you been, what have you been finding, Pete? Well, well, first of, I have a little story to share with you about something that occurred yesterday, and in some ways it's a little scary, and in some ways it's a backhanded compliment. I received an email from a friend of mine in the UK who was in receipt of an email from the a Chinese service that registers. URLs. And they wanted to know if it was okay to register n6qw.com.cn, which means it's in China, and or n6qw.cn, China. And they said they looked at the national registry and they already saw an n6qw.com and wondered if this was a problem. So why did the guy in the UK get this and not me, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. And so I think the common link is um, the direct conversion receiver, the MC1496. This particular ham in the UK is mentioned in there in a link that he developed some Gerber files for the MC1496 direct conversion receiver. Aha. So you're adding two and two. <laughs> Aha. So someday soon, you're going to see the MC 1496 direct conversion receivers. Hundreds uh, of millions of people will be using this in China, Pete. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so anyway, it got a little worrisome about do that. So I called GoDaddy and said, what's the story? He said, well, first of N6QW.com belongs to you. So they're not going to get their hands on that. But they do this frequently. They do this and then they start building stuff. And it looks like, yeah, connect to N6QW.CN. So it looks like I'm set up in business in China. So it's kind of a backhanded. <laughs> it's going to be like you and Alibaba, and you're going to be amazingly rich. It's great. I mean, I think it's no! terrific. <laughs> <laughs> you could take it out of the equation. They just steal the design. <laughs> what this, this this raises something that I want to ask about. And Dean KK4DAS and I have been talking about this. This business about counterfeit parts. Yeah, terrible. I mean, wait a second, but but when you think about it, how much money could they make 
from making counterfeit IRF 510s, right? Yeah, and especially IRF 510s that don't work. Well, who would go to the trouble of making – the only thing I could think of is that perhaps – they were trying to do sort of knockoff IRF 510s, their own IRF 510s, with the with the intention that they would work. And then for and then some they reason didn't. they don't, and they still try to sell them or something like that. Yeah. But but the idea that there's people out there sort of like, Wahaha, we will, you know, we will counterfeit the NE602 chip and sell them to the unsuspecting radio amateurs. I, I just don't, I mean, I, I don't know. It doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of money in that. Yeah. Well, so a word of the wise here, if you've got a website and you want to kind of protect it, you might take you might take ownership of the related URLs. Like yesterday I bought n6qw.net. Oh yeah. So so I have n6qw.com and 6 qwnet I mean, you can buy them all if you want to, but but this is a common practice and so just something to be aware of. Oh. Anyway, oh, it's kind I of mean, a back- solder. I gotta, I gotta check out solder smoke. It's probably, <laughs> yeah. it's probably being, you know, <laughs> used all over. Well, we know they're making candles. <laughs> they're what? <laughs> they're making candles. Oh, the can- and, per- and perfume and cologne. Perf- yeah, in Wimberley, Texas. Yeah, that's it. And that's yeah. good, good stuff out there. Yeah. Okay. okay, so this brings us around to cycle twenty-five. You're, you're gonna I, you're, you're gonna be like a wet blanket here, Pete. I'm holding out hope, man. I'm holding well, out hope. Well, fir- first of a little history, a little history here. There is a group that looks at this this prediction of the cycle, and about a couple years ago, they predicted cycle 25 is actually going to be worse than cycle 24. It's going to have less of a peak, and this this coordination group. Now, admittedly. It's it's a consensus, not unanimous. I mean, you know, what, what this calls to mind is Donald Sutherland in that in that film about World War II, where he was complaining about negative vibes. Yeah, you're sending me negative Ke- vibes, Kelly's, Pete. Kelly's hero. Kelly's hero. Negative vibes, <laughs> man. Yeah. Stop with the negative. <laughs> but go ahead, go ahead. So anyway, this group said cycle 25 is going to be only 115 peak, and cycle 19 was 300. So it's Twice as much. I was or born more. during cycle 19. Yeah, yeah. Good you were stuff. on the air during yeah, cycle Yeah, yeah. I remember. So anyway, um, cycle 25 has been predicted, and NOAA went along and said, yeah, we agree with that, the, the consensus of the group. There is a dissident group off to the side here who doesn't believe that. And and it's led by a guy by the name of Scott McIntosh, Dr. Scott McIntosh, and he's with some observatory in Colorado. And the rebels. Yeah, he's predicting, and they're showing some charts here that cycle 25 looks like this, and they're showing that it's off to the side. But something interesting, I've now taken an interest in looking at this, and I got to tell you, I'm not seeing what, what they're predicting. For one thing, I can set up my SDR to look at 384 kilohertz on 20 meters, so I can look all across the band. The other day, I saw six signals. Six signals, and I know my radio is working, and I know my antenna is working. I saw six signals. That's not indicative of a hot cycle 25. The other thing that I looked at, and this is worth worth looking at in detail, uh, one guy that listens to our podcast and regularly in communication actually does this as a day job. Said, "Yeah, you're missing some some things there, Pete." He said, "You're missing this point." And then he talked about sporadic E. He says it may be effects of a sporadic E uh, at this time, and it'll clear up in August. But if you look at a, a, a maximum usable frequency map, or you look at the propagation map, the East Coast is doing great. There are no signals on the left coast. I mean, it's devoid. And so I said, okay, maybe it's time of day. So I looked at the this map, this propagation map, at about five different times during the day, you know, like early in the morning, mid-morning, noon, mid-afternoon, early evening. And there was hardly any signals. Yet you look on the east coast, and it's loaded. I mean, they're, they're making paths to Europe and all over. So someone sitting on the east coast says, band looks good to me. You know why this is? You know why? No. Because ARRL headquarters is in Newington, Connecticut. There you go. There you go. There you go. go. So anyway, there's the there's this splinter group says it's going to be big, but take a listen. 
And if you have an SDR that you can look across the spectrum, take a look at it. And if you're not seeing the signals, it's not the propagation. And you I, know what I, you know what I do? I do something similar. I mean, all of my, all of my receivers and rigs here are either home brewed, brewed by me, which makes them suspect, or ancient, built by helicrafters or Hammerland back in the 1950s or 60s, which also makes them suspect. So sometimes if I hear that things don't sound quite right, <laughs> there's a really good possibility that it's the, the rig that I built or the old rig that's sort of failing. But there's a guy, Mehmet, an A5B, who has a web SDR, which is located just about nine miles east of me in Washington, D.C. And he has some really excellent web SDR receivers. And so just as sort of a gut check, I will, I will log on to, to Mehmet's receiver and see what he is seeing and hearing at, at his location. And that gives me a gut check. But I, I agree with you. Sometimes there's been a lot of times where the bands are just, just terrible. A lot of times it's because there's been flare activity that's, and the flares are raising the A index up really high. So there's a lot of absorption. So 40 meters is dead and even, you know, 20 and 17 are affected. But they're expecting but it, it, a blackout today. Yeah, it's it's so that that is pretty pretty disappointing. We got to hold on to hope though, Pete. We got to hold on to hope. I, I don't, don't know. I know. I don't. Then, then I looked at I, I saw if I could find this chart again, I thought it was kind of kind of cool. And I have not been able to locate it again. I said, "Oh yeah, I can find that." Someone has done done a chart on a 24-hour basis every hour. And they've looked at all the zones in the world. And it was interesting to see the east coast of the United States was seeing a, a muff of 17 meters. The left coast, the highest it saw at any time during the day was 7 megahertz. And most of the time it was around 4 to 5 over a 24-hour period. Mm. So... It's actually selective. So you got to be careful when they say, oh, yeah, sunspot cycle 25 is going to be great. It depends where you're at. That's really I can, strange. I can remember when I lived in Seattle, we thought we were in a hole, a black hole. <laughs> There'd be times <laughs> where there was no propagation to Seattle, and yet there was propagation to the United States. And it was not a matter of moving the time moving, you know, the gray line and all this BS. Real world, if you got an SDR or do like you do with Mehmet, Take a look. And if you don't see the signals there, that tells you something. That That's more realistic than say, oh, here's my graph and it's going I mean, to go that, up that, That's really, the, we, we, we hope that the, the gurus on this will sort of explain how this could possibly be that the West Coast is being affected the way it is. But, I mean, that's, you know, wow. Sporadic really... The answer was sporadic E. It's going to improve in August. Well, I'll hold my breath <laughs> until August. You're, you're going to put a crimp in my field day act, my two hours of field day. We're going to we're going to talk about that in a in a, in a, in a second. But okay. you also you also been looking into something really interesting that is sort of near and dear to yeah. me, and that is the Chiquita bananas or United Fruit in Honduras and the radio network that they set up early on. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, you got to talk about two pieces. Uh, you got to talk about the U.S. Navy. So there's really the Chiquita Banana and the U.S. Navy are really important things. First of, we have, we should thank the U.S. Navy for what we've been able to do in the handbands. And what I mean by that is when radio was first saw as a possibility of being widespread use in the United States, the Navy took the lead as early as 1898. 1898, they had Marconi come over working under Navy supervision Sing about putting radios aboard ships. And and the Navy established shore stations on the East Coast and the West Coast. By by 1904 or 5, a lot of, there were 20 to 30 ships had radios on them. The, the range was limited because of the frequencies they were using. As a matter of fact, I didn't know this, but the USS Chicago was parked off of San Francisco when they had the earthquake. It was the only communications link <laughs> they had. In, in 2006, uh, 1906, April wow. 18th, 1906, the USS Chicago was relaying radio signals about the status of the earthquake. So, I mean, it goes way back. But what happened was the ham started up. And, of course, we 
think about 1914 and Hiram Percy Maxim and the ARRL. The guys were kind of wandering into the Navy frequencies, which is at the low end. But the Navy says, we'll fix you. So they had a law passed that says hams can only operate 200 meters and down. That's right. Thank you for the gift. Thank you for the gift. <laughs> yeah, the Navy the strikes gift. again. <laughs> thank you for the gift. But the Navy was really, really very involved in, in all. As a matter of fact, Teddy Roosevelt put the Navy in charge of all the frequency allocations. And so for up to about 1920, anything radio was the Navy. U.S. Navy had charge of that. So it was really kind of interesting. So this brings up Chiquita Banana. Now, the United Fruit Company, as early as the early 1900s, was establishing operations in Central America with a banana trade. And they had all these ships and everything else. And they realized the delivery of bananas is very critical because they're they're a time-sensitive product. You pick the banana and it ain't too long before it's brown. <laughs> right. So how do you get it from here to there? And of course, the communication becomes a very important thing. So they looked at establishing, getting radio systems. And there were two companies at the time, Marconi and Telefunken. But Marconi was kind of heavy handed. If you signed up with Marconi, he supplied the equipment, he supplied the operators, you did nothing. All you did is pay for the service. And the same thing with Telefunken. So United Fruit Company, parent predecessor to Chiquita Banana, said that's no good. So they got involved buying their own radio equipment, radio stations, and establishing them in Central, Central America because their two principal shipping points were the United States, principally Louisiana, New Orleans, mm -hmm. and then also into Europe. So they had this extensive radio system. As a matter of fact, they spent an equivalent of about $68 million in today's dollars putting radios aboard ships and establishing all these shore stations so they can keep in touch with the radios. So where Chiquita Banana enters the picture is in 1919, the Navy gathered up a group of companies, and including AT&T, General Electric, Westinghouse and United Fruit Company, and they said, we want you to form the Radio Corporation of America. And the reason for this is 1919 was just after World War I. The Navy realized the vulnerability that we had because a lot of the radio equipment was not made here in the United States, but Marconi, mm. Offshore, Telefunken, in England. So they saw this as a vulnerability and they said, can't, can't have that. Not, you know, kind of look at the after action report, can't have that. No. So they said, we're going to set up RCA. And as it turned out, they made General Electric the major stockholder. So RCA was owned by General Electric Company because they had the controlling interest in the stock, which we find kind of interesting because later on, General Electric and RCA are making tubes. General Electric and RCA are making transistors, but yet RCA is the principal stockholder. But the United Fruit got involved because they had invested all this money, and they were a big-time player in, in radio in this, this tropical network that they had. So it's really kind of interesting to see the ancillary to that. So then, because they had the radio network, they start selling radio services. So if you want, if you were a private individual and wanted to communicate by radio, you went to United Fruit Company and they had all the contacts of the station. As a matter of fact, uh, their banana ships, they bought a lot of surplus uh, military equipment that you could carry passengers. So someone says, why don't we carry bananas and people? <laughs> so a lot of the tourism that was developed early on into Central America, United Fruit Company, Chiquita Banana. So, I mean, it's kind of interesting to see how these guys, matter of fact, in one case of one of the countries, uh, there was not such a good tax situation. So the guy had a United Fruit, hired some mercenaries. They went in and <laughs> they took over a country, reestablished the old president, and then they got a you know, special arrangement for taxation and what have you to circumvent. So. <laughs> yeah, well, there's, a, there's always been a lot. There's always been like a really special connection between Honduras 
and New Orleans because and, and a lot of it goes yeah. back to the early early yeah. banana trade. And I, I I lived in Honduras for several years, so no no the place really really yeah. well. Very interesting, interesting history. You put up I, I found a link this morning when I was looking about the creation of RCA, and it's exactly as you describe. I put that up on the on the on the blog page. You'll you'll see that. So really really kind of cool stuff there, uh, and how commerce often drives. Things. Yes, let's. We didn't even talk about ITT. <laughs> in, yeah, but in, in what, what you said about the Navy's misgivings is 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 really interesting, and and it turned out that they were were Wrong. wise. <laughs> I put up a blog post about Marconi's proclivities and loyalties yes. that was uh, really yes. kind of surprising. We have a tendency to kind of lionize him, but um, there were reasons to be concerned. That played out, yes. especially during the 20s and prior to his death in the 1930s. So, yeah, interesting stuff. There's also hey. a co- connection with Tulane University. Oh, yeah. The, the, the president of Tulane lives in the house that was the mansion of the guy that had United Fruit Company because he put a lot of money in there. By the way, the other thing is... That's the Sam guy, the Banana Man. Sam, Sam the, the Banana, Banana Man, Zemmeray. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sam the Banana Man also uh, was very influential in installing... Franklin Delano Roosevelt as president. There you go. <laughs> interesting, interesting, <laughs> some interesting, interesting history. There you go. Hey, well, tell us about the Max 2870. Okay. So someone has been in regular contact with me, has written software for the 2870 so that you can control it with a Raspberry Pi and run it on the SDR. Finally, we we, Finally. we we issued this call. I told people, I said, believe it or not, you can help Pete Giuliano, yeah. who knows everything, has built everything, and has done everything. You can help him with something here and do the software for the 2870. Somebody came through. Yeah, now it's a little more, it's a little complex about getting installed, and I've got only because I have limited time. I actually physically have a 2870, and I actually have started to load the software in a Raspberry Pi, but just do not have access to a lot of time to be able to do it, but we're real close. I see victory around the corner. Yeah. Cool. Very good. Hey, Pete, are you going to take time for field day? You're going to do field two, day? Two hours. Two hours. You're going to do two hours. That's that's okay. That's it's, it's in keeping with our our normal solder smoke kind of aloof, snooty. We're not going out in the hot and the mosquitoes kind of thing. Yeah. Well, this but, year I think you're limited to 100 watts. Uh huh. So you can't run the KWs. So oh, wow. there's going to be a lot, a lot of comp- a lot of competition. So actually, on, on, there's a couple of radios I'm thinking of running, and and one of them is I've dusted off my Atlas 180. I picked up an Atlas 180 for a hundred bucks, and there was nothing wrong with it. So it it goes only up to 20 meters. So it looks like I may do a 40 20. 4020. All right. Small little Atlas. Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. You you could win. The yes. Southern California Boat Anchors Field Day Single Operator yes. <laughs> Backyard Division. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, there you go. Good for that. Hey, Pete, it's time for the Shameless Commerce Division. Yes. We've already covered our sponsor, Parts Candy, and I put a link on him up on the on the page. But listen, I thought what we'd do this time is I would appeal for help from the solder smoke community. And I do need some help. I need people to watch the YouTube videos. Now, the longer is better. And on YouTube, success is often based on how many hours people are spending to watch your videos. Now, one of the problems we've had is many of our videos, my videos have been quite short, you know, five, 10 minutes. We're doing hour long videos now that we're, we're posting these videos of the podcast. But look, all I would say is this, if you're, if you're in the shack and you're working on something and you need something playing in the background that's inspirational, you know, think about putting on a solder smoke uh, YouTube video. Just go to YouTube and search for the solder smoke channel. You'll find all of our videos there, solder smoke at YouTube, and just just put them on, play them in the background, and this will help us, help me get up my uh, number of viewed hours there. And uh, I think these videos will be of, of interest to you. So you, need that, encourage... you need that SETI software. The what? <laughs> the SETI software is in the background, you know? <laughs> the back the back. <laughs> Pete had the scheme that we would use the SETI software to play in the background. I, I, I tried the SETI software. 
and it, it, it kept crashing my computers. I, I saw, I blame the aliens. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, but listen, I mean, remote every time you turn on a computer, it connects to the YouTube in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Boost the Suddenly shower. I have a zillion hours. <laughs> I'm as rich as Bezos or Elon <laughs> Musk. There you go. Hey, uh, another thing you could do to help out is put links to the Solder Smoke blog on your own web pages and blogs. All these web pages and blogs have a way that you could link to the Solder Smoke blog. That helps us because the Google search engines then look and see, aha. Thousands of people around the world are linking to this solder smoke thing, and um, my ratings will go up in the in the in the Google in the search engine. Search engine optimization is what we're talking about here. S E O P. Um, you know, one other thing I, I would say is I, I would encourage people to use the solder smoke blog. There's actually a lot of information. I find myself using the thing quite often, and I use it in several ways not only well i'm not i'm not checking to see what articles are because obviously i know what the articles are because i put them up there but along the left hand column we have a section devoted to propagation so if you want to see what the a index is what the k index is what's happening with the geomagnetic field what what's predicted for the different bands you could take a look at that right there on the blog if you want to get it updated click on that little widget and it'll take you to the site where it's actually updated to the minute Below it, I have a couple of links to other propagation sources that talk about what's happening in terms of solar storms, uh, geomagnetic activity, alerts from NOAA. So there's a, there's kind of one section there along the left. It's along the left hand side of the blog page that gives a lot of good propagation information. The other thing I would say where it's where it's useful is on the right hand column of the blog. If you go down a bit. You'll see I have links to other blogs and other web pages. And these are updated quite frequently. So sometimes I'll think, hey, I wonder what's going on. I wonder what people are working on. And I'll go over to that section and I'll see, you know, the latest from SWL Post from Thomas, uh, K4SWL, the latest from Farhan, uh, the latest from uh, Mike, Mike Murphy, WU2D, the latest from uh, Peter down in, in Melbourne, VK3YE, all this stuff. It's updated a lot, so it's a good way to keep in touch with what's happening there. Realize that the ones that you see there, the top 10, are the 10 that have been updated most recently. If you click on See All, you'll see all of them. Your your blog is there all the time. I saw, what, I saw the one you put up this morning on prototyping. You know, really, really interesting stuff. So use it that way. And then finally, the other thing I would say is Please put comments on the on the articles. I mean, a lot of times I'll see there's a lot of visitors, a lot of people reading the article, but very few comments. The comments are really useful. I like to get a dialogue going, discussing, you know, what you see. Comments. This is this is true. This is not true. I I, I tried this. It didn't work. Links to whatever you're working on. Things like that. So put those comments up there. We like comments and we like dialogue. I I turned the comments off. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you why. I get a, all these people are writing me these young ladies. <laughs> oh man, well, you, well, they, you, you, that's a good move. That you want to stay out of trouble, Pete. Yeah. It's it's the beret. It's the beret. That's the thing, man. You, you, the beret's causing you a lot of trouble. <laughs> Turn off the comments, man. We're, we're not going to make any comments about these comments. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, listen, I, I said I was going to talk a little bit about what I have on my bench. And I've actually been been quite active. Uh, first, I guess early on, I was working on a, uh, a Sony ICF SW1 shortwave receiver. This thing is from like the, the, the late 1980s, I think. It's a tiny little thing. It's supposedly the smallest shortwave receiver ever made. Sony made a bunch of them. They sold like hotcakes. They were very popular, but they quickly went bad because there were bad electrolytics in it, bad surface mount electrolytics. Apparently Sony, now there's, there's debate about why this happened. Sony might've just got a bad bunch of electrolytics. Others more cynical say that this is a planned obsolescence thing, that by putting these capacitors in there, the manufacturer kind of guaranteed that somebody would have to come back and buy a new shortwave receiver after the components went bad. But there's sort of a cottage industry that's developed around the ICF SW1 where you can buy on the internet replacement kits for the electrolytic capacitors. So you, you, you send them like 12 bucks, they send you this little bag with the capacitors in it, 
And then you, then you got to go in there and do the delicate work of pulling out surface mount electrolytics that's and hard. putting in, it's hard. It's not for the faint of heart. It's really scary. I, I, I lifted a, a pad or two and had to go in there and replace the pads. I, I came close to blow. And I kept thinking, I'm pretty, I'm a pretty experienced builder. A newcomer would definitely have trouble with this, but I, I got them in there and it works. So I got the thing working. It was given to me, uh, about 10 years ago by my friend, John Roberts, who, who was a ham and he just, it, it, he couldn't get the thing to work. And I said, I'd work that, on it. That's John, not the, that's not the SCOTUS guy, is it? The, the what? Is no, 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 different, <laughs> color, if, di yeah. a different John Robert. Yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah. uh, anyway, oh, uh, you I, never know in Washington, you never know in Washington, DC. <laughs> yeah. It could be, could be right down the road. No, no, no. Um, but anyway, I got the thing working. And one of the things I discovered when I was looking at this was you go on the internet and you discover that um, this particular receiver was supposedly, and the, the sources on the internet on this one are quite good, like the, uh, the, the spy museum and things like that, that this receiver was used by people who had a, um, well, shall we say, professional interest in receiving the signals from the so-called number stations. There are these stations where somebody gets on, and if you tune in, you've been, you've been hearing them many times over the years, as I have too, you're going across the short wave band, um, and all of a sudden you hear 60, six, seven, six. three, two, or sometimes in Spanish, dos, veintitres, treinta y cuatro, ochenta y seis. You know, and so you're saying, what the hell is this? And the story is that these are transmissions being sent to spies in other territories, and they sit down there and they just pull out their Sony ICF SW1, <laughs> write it down and decode it. It says, you know, you know, do whatever your dastardly thing that Boris and Natasha are going to do <laughs> from with the message from the secret squirrel. Um, anyway, that was that was kind of interesting. But I got this thing working, and once I got it working, it went into the box, and it will be heading to SSSS. Okay, so that's one that's one thing I've been working. It was kind of fun. It was hard to do. On the other end of the technological spectrum, from the smallest receiver, now I'm working on the HQ100, which um, I, I picked my HQ. Oh, one one back thing back to the Sony I, ICF SW1. I started thinking about the vintage of this thing. This is sort of mid '80s to to late 1980s. That's the time of the Walkman. I still have my Walkman. You know. Top Gun, Maverick, and all that, it's out. The original movie was from that era, too. So my Walkman and the Sony are both sort of Top Gun, late 1980s era. I started rummaging around in the in the junk box as part of my Divide the Shack effort. I found my old, my old Sony Walkman. Pete, it still works. It still works. At least the radio section in it worked, and the motors to spin the cassette, they work, too. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. HQ100 going further back in time, back to around 1956. Yeah. Um, I picked this thing up in the Dominican Republic in 1993. It was in horrible shape. It had a coating of nicotine all over it. It had been the victim of power supply surges through the AC line cord and probably nearby lightning strikes through the RF antenna input. Um, I picked it up. Uh, it was one of my first kind of repairs on a uh, tube type rig. One of the IF cans was open. I replaced that. But, and then it's sort of been limping along, but it hasn't really been working too well. I've, I've had it paired up with the DX100. I used it on AM. Not working too well. A lot of things wrong with it. So I finally decided, okay, I'm going to start working on this thing again. And I pulled it out and I found all kinds of things that were wrong with it. And I started repairing it. There was a problem with the, the BFO switch, the AVC wasn't working right. The S meter wasn't working right. The, um, there were all kinds of things. I never really used the Q multiplier properly. You know, I've been scornful of Q multipliers. They're basically little regen receivers that have worked their way into otherwise nice super hats. But I, I, once I got the problems worked out, I realized how useful and powerful that Q multiplier could be in a receiver that has no crystal filters, no mechanical filters, no filters at all other than the 455 KCIF cans. But man, you turn on that Q multiplier, you tune it right, it really narrows it down. You get single signal reception, 
really nice. So I, I started really liking the HQ 100 to the, oh, I found, I found that one of the, um, one of the antenna input coils in the RF amplifier was shorted and this was screwing up the AVC. I had to fix that. So there was a lot of kind of good good repair stuff. You know, when you when you're repairing something, you want the problem to be hard to diagnose, difficult to find. You don't want to just go through this whole thing and then find out, oh, the the switch was dirty and it just needed a shot of, you know, uh, of yeah, contact could. cleaner. No, that's that, that's kind of oh, okay. You want instead to find out, oh yeah, one of the little wires inside T1 was shorting from primary to secondary. And that's why the AVC wasn't working. That's what happened with me. That's kind of a cool repair, all right? Anyway, so I, I fixed this thing up and I started to like the HQ100. I'm listening to it all the time. I'm listening to WRMI out of Miami. I'm listening to Radio Marti. On 40 meters, I could hear Radio New Zealand in the morning around 7245, somewhere around there. They're booming in with droning on about the news from New Zealand. I mean, the news from New Zealand is, I got to say, really boring, but um, it's fun to listen to. So I've left it on the on the bench. It's right next to the computer here. I put a picture up on the blog. But then now this created a gap. What am I going to listen to on 80 and 40 meter AM with the DX100? I started looking around. This is, again, part of the, the Southern Shack, Southern, Southern Smoke Shack South kind of decluttering. And I, I found the Made for the Mighty Midget. Perfect, to 75 and, 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 and 40 meters. And I started fooling around, tweaking, working on that. Again, it was sort of halfway working, but not working too well. But I had to go in there and address some problems. So I looked at it. One thing I found, the detector circuit. You know, if, when you've been in this, in this hobby for a while, you start looking at schematics and you say, I, you, I know you do this all the time. Why did he do that? So Lou McCoy in his 1966 QST article had a detector circuit in the mate for the mighty midget. Pete, the detector comes right after the 455 KCIF can and right before the audio amplifier. That's where you put the detector, right? He's got two diodes, two germanium diodes in there. Your beloved germanium devices, two germanium diodes in there. Okay, so far so good. But the input capacitor is 100 PF. The output capacitor of the detector is 100 PF. Holy cow. When you look at the reactance of 100 yeah. PF, at, it's, it's bad enough at 455 KC at the input. There it's about, I think it's, it's like 1.5 kilo ohms. At the output at audio, it's in the mega ohm range. No wonder this thing was deaf. And I looked in there and I started seeing, you know, I've been, I built this thing 30 years ago and been poking away at it ever since. And I start seeing repairs and mods that I did 20, 25 years ago. And no wonder I put a 0.1 microfarad cap across the output 100 PF cap. That was probably the only way I got it working. So I started talking and um, Scott, who has also been working on the Made for the Mighty Midget, you know, he came back and told me, he said, man, they changed the detector circuit. You know, if you look at the 1966 QST, the original article by Lou McCoy, it's got one detector circuit. But if you look at the same article reprinted in the 1969 AWRL handbook, they've changed the detector circuit. They got rid of the two 100 PF caps. They got rid of the, the second germanium diode. And it's just they uh, they they have it running that way, so it's 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 pretty it's pretty simple, and uh, much simpler and work and working much better. So anyway, that's the uh, the mate for the mighty midget. It's back on the air, and I'm using it on 40 meters. Pete, we're getting short on time here, man. We got to go. We could do we could do we could do mailbag, but if you have to run, I'll carry on. Okay? I, I do. I, All I right. have to run, so I'll let you carry on here. Anyway, uh, seven threes from the left coast. Uh, got a medication run that i gotta make you gotta do it and i'm sorry i was a little late this morning i got thrown off because we were you you were you were even earlier this morning up at odark 30 pete take it easy good luck you bet we'll we'll talk to you real soon i'll carry on with the mailbag seven three seven seven three okay mailbag carries on all right mailbag